Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at the upcoming and final DLC for Total War Warhammer 2, The Silence and the Fury. After over three years of updates, both free and paid, it all culminates to this farewell DLC, focusing on the Lizardmen from Game 2, while bringing in the Beastmen from Game 1 into Game 2. Almost poetically, the first post-launch DLC for Game 1 was the Call of the Beastmen that released in July of 2016, so this is a great way to see just how far Creative Assembly have come with the series, but it also raises some interesting predicaments. More on those in a bit. Now, if you're interested in grabbing The Silence and the Fury after watching this review, you might want to consider using my game store link provided in the description and in comment down below to support the channel as you buy. With all that said, and a thanks to Creative Assembly for providing me with a review copy, let's not waste any more time. Has The Silence and the Fury left me in stunned silence or in a furious state? Has Creative Assembly done well in its farewell to Total War Warhammer 2? Well, the first thing to note, right off the bat, is the delineation between what this DLC gives you and what it doesn't. As far as the Beastmen are concerned, if you do not own the Call of the Beastmen DLC for the first game, you will only get Torox the Brass Bull as a Legendary Lord, alongside the Doom Bull Lord, the War Gore Hero, the Tusk Gore Chariot, the Gorgon, and the Jabberslife. And while you will get access to the full regular unit roster, my understanding is that you won't get access to the Regiments of Renown, outside of the Grog Hooves of Wolf's Run, the Vorbergland Broodmother, or the Blood Brute Behemoth. For the Lizardmen, you'll get the new Legendary Lord Oxyodl, the Skink Oracle Hero, the Chameleon Stalker, the Coatl, and the Feral Troglodon, alongside a few new regiments of renown, the Pale Death, Geltblom's Terror, and the Spirit of Tepak. This division of content leads to some awkward maths that we'll talk about in just a bit, it does go beyond just talking about the specific DLC, but do keep in mind that this review focuses entirely on what you get from purchasing this piece of content, and I try my best to exclude all the freebies that you'd have access to, whether you get this DLC or not. Now, of the two campaigns, neither cares for the Vortex storyline, as can be expected by now, and instead, we see Torox needing to fill his Marks of Ruination bar before engaging in a final battle, while Oxyotl has to pursue visions of the Old Ones before being able to engage in his final battle. The two are pit against each other, naturally, and I have to say both campaigns are quite enjoyable. Torox has a Rampage mechanic, filling up his Rampage bar at a rate determined by his momentum. Both are affected by his aggression and success. Winning battles will increase his momentum, increasing the rate at which his Rampage bar fills up, but losing battles, retreating, or sitting idle will reduce his momentum, and if that ever hits zero, the Rampage bar resets as well. Building the Rampage Bar unlocks temporary rewards you can choose from, so you'll want to keep your momentum from falling, but it's awfully tempting to spend it to use Torox's special ability that resets his movement range for the cost of 2 momentum, though this cost can be reduced a bit using the right Rampage reward, and it can only be used when you've already crossed the first threshold in a Rampage. So, you need to sort of strike a balance here. When you reach the end of the line, it all resets, meaning you can no longer use this ability. So you want to almost slow your roll so that you have access to this replenishment for as many uses as possible without overdoing it and losing your ongoing rampage. But either way, you're encouraged and given the tools to stay constantly on the front foot, aggressively diving into battle after battle, stringing together multiple in a single turn if you're able to preserve your units without needing to replenish them. This adds its own layer of challenge and should you choose to embrace it, there's some fun to be had in seeing how far you can go each turn rather than playing in the more traditional Total War way where you fight one battle per turn, wait to replenish or recruit, rinse and repeat. Between this and the fact that he's built around buffing the beastiest of beastmen, a Torox campaign is brutally aggressive, needing you to set up herdstones, cause devastation, and perform rituals, all to fill up your marks of ruination before you can partake in the final battle. The shortcoming here is that they've literally just taken part of the Beastmen rework and made it the campaign objective rather than giving something specific to Torox based on his momentum or rampage mechanics. Bill Bar win game doesn't really put the C in CA in my opinion and we've seen it done time and time again now. Funnily enough, Oxyodl does not suffer from the same issue. Perhaps it's because the Lizardmen have always been around in game 2 that CA knew they had to do something completely different for him, whereas simply adding the Beastmen alongside a free rework would be enough to make Torox seem equally fresh. Either way, Oxyotl is fun as well. Now, I've not been the biggest fan of most Lizardmen campaigns. 
I think their units are cool. I think the art is cool. It all, you know, is very exciting from a lore perspective. But the playstyle has never really clicked with me, especially in battle. Now, Oxyodl's skink favored approach and starting units helps tackle some of these concerns. But beyond that, his campaign map mechanics make him feel like the commander of this strike team, like a skink team six that can instantly go where needed, responding to imminent threats to keep things in order, to keep things from falling to chaos, literally and metaphorically. While he can play like a regular Lizardman campaign, the silent sanctums and visions of the old ones make him stand out nicely and give players some choice with regards to their approach. Visions of the old ones act as the quest giving system, coming up from time to time, showing Oxyotl where trouble is brewing, where an army might need to be defeated or a city taken. These actions must be accomplished within a turn limit, and failing to do so will bring about negative consequences, while performing the needed task successfully will provide rewards and will help Oxyotl make progress towards his campaign objectives. Thankfully, you don't ever have to physically travel to these locations over several turns, as you're able to use the visions of the old ones to help you quickly teleport over to them instead. Once per turn, you're able to use this teleportation, preserving your movement points when you come out the other end, and beyond teleporting to these visions, you can also teleport to your capital and to any silent sanctum with a specific structure built in it, though only one such structure can exist at any given time, meaning old ones need to be dismantled to build replacements at new locations. Silent Sanctums are the Lizardmen equivalent to Undercities and Pirate Coves, giving you access to a second layer of unique buildings with very limited building slots. You start with one at your capital, and upon acquiring enough gems through completing missions or using the right skills from the skill tree, you can establish more. And you can establish them anywhere you have vision at the time of establishment, within friendly and enemy territory. These allow you to scout ahead, add buffs to armies in a region not yet under your control, and even randomly ambush enemy armies in the region from time to time with generic preset patrol armies, as long as you've built the appropriate buildings. And again, with the right structure, you can teleport Oxyodl and his full stack next to a Silent Sanctum on a whim. Since only one of these teleportation destination buildings can exist in the world at a time, you'll be demolishing old ones to establish new ones as your reach spreads and as your needs shift from offensive to defensive and vice versa. Now, only Oxyotl can use the visions of the old ones to teleport around, though, and it really makes Oxyotl stand out as a lord. And since the visions will sometimes ask you to declare fresh wars, you'll find yourself hesitating at times, or simply letting some missions fail to make way for others, though this might just come back to bite you down the line as the consequences of the penalties might be difficult to overcome later. At the end of the day, you have to accomplish hard visions of the old ones quests to complete your objectives, and this is an example of an objective that engages with a completely unique mechanic, rather than one that ties into a mechanic available to all other lords of the same faction. Again, the difference between Oxyodl and Torox over here. Oxyodl has his objectives tie into his unique mechanics, whereas Torox is just sort of using existing beastmen mechanics that everybody else has access to, but now for him they're just an objective, whereas every beastman faction needs to participate in the same activities. It, it feels like, again, a bit of a, a bit of a shortcoming for that Torox campaign. On the flip side, though, Oxyodl's campaign is also not perfect. The quest battle in particular is rather plain. There's a moment where it feels like you'll have diverging paths and choices, which is pretty cool, but it literally makes the most minor of differences, lasts about, you know, three turns worth of time at most. And either way, the battle itself is all right. Torox has a more challenging and interesting quest battle, though, again, in the grand scheme of things, it's also relatively plain, to be honest. We've seen better set pieces in Total War Warhammer 1 and 2 before, but I kind of wish these quest battles got more love and attention and just had a bigger presence overall. The Lords and their new units are visually on par with everything else you'd expect from Total War Warhammer games. Uh, there are a fun few animations to be found among them, the little twirl of the Gorgon, a belly flop or two here and there, these are impressive models with impressive animations, with the occasional jank that is par for the course in these games. Again, I'm not one who stays zoomed in at all times outside of when recording cinematic shots, so it's not the end of the world for me personally, though I understand it bothers some more than others, but I thought I'd mention it and point it out. Yes, from time to time you'll get, you know, slipping and sliding and the weird attacks that don't really look like they line up. That kind of jank can be expected, and there's more of that with this DLC as well. Now, this definitely feels like the most monster-centered DLC, so 
you can expect quite a bit of spectacle. For the lords and heroes, the new skill trees all have fun buffs and abilities to explore, and the new Skink Oracle is a fun caster who's also able to get work done from a distance and in melee. There are a couple of issues to stats and some redundant traits that have been flagged with the developers already, but by and large, there's a decent spread of units between monsters, heroes, and regular units alongside their skills, abilities, and spellcasting options. But here's where things start to get a little strange. In order to own the full Beastmen roster, you need to get the $20 Call of the Beastmen DLC. Without that, not only are you missing out on some regiments of renown, but you're also missing out on everything this half of this screen has to offer. But if you get that DLC, you're paying $20 to also gain access to a mini campaign that you'll likely never touch unless you decide to boot up the first game in 2021 for some reason. Why is there no permanent discount for that DLC at this point? 50% off would bring it in line with all of the other DLC we're seeing for Total War Warhammer 2 that works in a similar way. Now, in order to own the entire Lizardman roster, you also need to get the Prophet and the Warlock and the Hunter and the Beast. These are two $10 DLCs, meaning again, an additional 20 bucks. Now, sure, if you've been playing along and buying DLC all along the way, you likely already own these and they're both solid DLCs, but it's starting to get a little more convoluted as we go on. The full Lizardman roster cannot be had without spending 30 bucks over the base game. But 20 bucks gets you the entire Vampire Coast roster or the entire Tomb King roster alongside unique campaign mechanics or legendary lords. Like it's starting to get a little strange, you know? And this all makes it difficult to judge or even recommend DLC in isolation. I can't necessarily say you should grab this one if you're planning on playing the Lizardmen or Beastmen anytime soon without also highly recommending you grab the aforementioned DLC as well because otherwise you're just getting an incomplete experience. It's not like you don't want access to, say, the Dread Saurian just because you're playing as Oxyotl, but you won't have it unless you get an entirely unrelated piece of DLC alongside this one. Anyway, it's a little tangential, I suppose, to the topic at hand, but I wanted to flag it nonetheless because it does impact what I'm about to say next. The Silence and the Fury adds a lot of very enjoyable mechanics, systems, and units on top of the ones in other DLC. Torox and the Beastmen can mostly stand on their own, though you'll miss not having access to these other lords. The additions with Oxyotl, as far as units are concerned, aren't enough without also getting the units from the Prophet and the Warlock and the Hunter and the Beast. If you haven't yet played a Lizardman campaign, I'd suggest waiting until you can scoop all three up before you dive in. There's plenty else to keep you busy while you wait for the Steam Fall Sale or something instead. If you already own the previous DLC and want to play a fresh Lizardman campaign, definitely give Oxyotl a go. He's loads of fun, and as I said earlier, Horox feels like he stands out more than he actually does, but there's a lot of fun to be had with Rampage and Momentum mechanics, the simplicity of the objectives be damned. Top-notch voice work, exquisite writing, and fun new mechanics that twist traditional Total War mechanics in interesting ways. Neither of these factions have been my favorite previously, and yet here I am, finally finding fun with both. I wish the quest battles were a bit more involved, and I'd like to have Torox actually stand out among his cohort as far as objectives are concerned. At $10 though, Creative Assembly have found that sweet spot where it's kind of hard not to recommend, but yes, if you don't have the other Lizardmen related DLC, and you don't have the Call of the Beastmen, make sure to grab them all at the same time. If that means waiting for a sale on them, so be it. Now if you do already have those DLCs, and you're looking to play a new Lizardmen or Beastmen campaign sometime soon, both of these have been a lot of fun and perhaps even the only campaign fun I've had with either faction as a whole, to be perfectly honest. Not an indictment against the factions before this DLC, but they've never, again, they've never clicked for me personally from a gameplay style. Not quite like this. And if you felt the same way in the past, that's something to consider. The Beastmen rework has solved some of the pain of playing as a Horde faction, and the skink focus of Oxyotl counters the typically slow ambling of Lizardmen on the battlefield. I hope this review has given you some insight into the Silence and the Fury. Between reworks, freebies, and multiple DLCs over multiple games, it can all get a little confusing with regards to what you're actually paying for and what you would have gotten for free anyway. So hopefully this has shed some light on that, while also highlighting the good and bad of the DLC. It's not perfect, sure, but if you're planning on checking these factions out again, it's worth considering these two lords to do so. If not, then hold off. As I mentioned before, if you're interested in picking up The Silence and the Fury, you can do so at my link in the description and pinned comment down below to support the channel as you buy. 
And if you'd like more strategy gaming news, previews, reviews, let's plays, and more, don't hesitate to subscribe. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. That'll keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.